Yeah, really warm welcome. Um, now I've got a bit of a special guest here. So James, thanks so much for being the presenter on this talk. So it is the approach to managing an unwell child um, and so I'm Lahira and that's James. Um, obviously, you know me from ABC's of Anesthesia and my education stuff there. Um, and James is going to be taking us through this. And again, it's a really open forum. Like I want you guys to ask questions. We've got time. We'll give you answers. And if there's something that's going to take a bit longer, you can just send me an email and I'll make sure that I address it in another in another spot. Um, I'll have the chat operating as well. Please ask any questions you need um, and I'll be able to type those in as James is presenting. And also, you know, uh, I'll get actually James to I flip to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so I, was, I was actually just going to introduce James. So James is one of our Western Health interns, and he's done. He's really interested in pediatrics, and, his, and he did his rotation in that. And he also, um, yeah, he's really interesting because there's so it's, it's like the anesthetic thing. So I think James, you're doing well with anesthetic. <laughs> it seems like there's always someone praying for an Iron Man or some kind of crazy cycle cycle race. Um, anyway, so he approached me saying, "I'd like to do some teaching." And when he presented this topic, I was I was really impressed because. You know, as a consultant, I'm just years and years down the track. And there's a lot of things that I don't realize are important and things that you won't necessarily know as a medical student. And so James is an intern. He, you know, the, the, the presentation is so focused on relevant stuff for interns. So I thought this is something I definitely want to do a bonus session for you guys on. Um, yeah, the, the stuff that you're going to hear is just so practical. Um, you get into a rotation, you address these things. It's not it's none of all the boring stuff. It's just really hard hitting, high high yield. Uh, tips and tricks you know, in pediatrics and we're going to cover a lot of things in a certain you know not the full detail but the most practical detail and on the usual stuff instagram twitter twitter and there's a facebook page and group please join if you haven't already so um Lahira and i are going to be chatting tonight mostly me and i'm going to ask him some questions and make sure i test him about um, doctors a b c d e so you would have seen this um, from a BLS and ALS perspective. We're, we're going to put a bit of a PEDS twist on it. We're going to be talking, talking about analgesia, which is similar to adult analgesia, but with a few little differences. Fluid management, which is really, really important and a little bit different to adult stuff. And then we're going to touch on sedation, mostly procedural. So we'll leave the anesthetic stuff to the, the people who know the most. So we're going to go through the basics really, really quickly. So um, we're going to go through doctors A, B, C, D, E. So just as the first question, um, someone can get, get the easiest question of the night. What does this stand for? Can I get anyone unmuting themselves? Actually, we, let's pick on some people just to get people rolling. Uh, Jason, what do you reckon? Doctors A, B, C, D, E. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's usually the protocol that we follow in Sort of situations in emergency so d for danger r for response s for send for help a airway breathing circulation disability and exposure um yeah nice one beauty good job and and actually the funny thing is it's so surprising like when, when we when i'm an als instructor and i instruct even consultants they forget to say state the procedure um it, 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 like it's so easy right but it's really great jason that you, you actually remember those because when we're testing people for their exams, they forget to do this stuff. So they don't you know, no, like no one take it lightly in real life in the exam. We really want you to say each of those points uh, so you don't miss out on anything. Yeah, and I think it it's like drummed in to us as med students to go through these principles, and it feels like we're just doing it for the sake of it. But if you approach a, a sick patient, whether that be a kid or an adult, and you go, okay, what am I? What am I doing? What am I doing? Okay, doctors A B C D. And that just takes you through the process and you actually can't miss anything if you go through the simple uh, mnemonic like that. So as Jason said, airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure. So we'll go through each in turn um, and hopefully give you some key points. So to start with airway. So we're observing. Actually, so we're looking... Let's, get, let's yep. get someone to tell us about it. All right, uh, let's pick on somebody else. Um, I see Min. I'm not sure if that's Minnow, who's one of my fellow interns, but Min. So what was the question again? Can you talk to me about what you'd be looking for um, when you're assessing your kid's airway? Okay, so basically you have to look at the mouth to see if there's any action there, any stridals. And then you have, um, so basically you need to look for any patent airway, any of way in a sense 
Yeah, good. And you said Strider. Strider, that's a really good point. What is Strider and what does it sound like if you want to give Strider is more like upper respiratory upper respiratory obstruction. Yeah, great. And do you know what it sounds like if you were to mimic it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. That's very good. Yeah. So you can like, it's very distinct. You can hear it from the end of the bed and you like you're immediately worried as, as an onlooker because it sounds terrible. Like they're gasping for air. So yeah, good point. Um, okay, moving on. So uh, when would we oxygenate someone, Spritty, from Deacon? Hello there. Hello. Um, oxygenating when um, like the stats are falling below 95, the O2 saturation stats. Um, yeah, good. And I think well, for kids, it's even like um, like lesser, so 98 or 97 or something. Yeah, so I guess it depends what you where you're working. Um, we'll tend to you at Western, they tend to look at about 94. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're working at RCH or you know if you're working at um, another hospital, they might use a different cutoff. But yeah, 95, 94, that that's that's a good value. And what would you start with? What type of um, mask and what type of uh, leader what how much yeah. oxygen would you give uh, like i think like nasal bronze initially um and like two liters rumor or something like that yeah 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 great and i guess the, the thing about peds that we don't think about with adults is like if you're putting nasal prongs or a face mask on a kid they're gonna absolutely hate that, that. and if they have um enough energy they'll fight back so trying to maybe put it on mum first or dad first to make them feel like it's okay and then apply it if you have time of course if they're if they're not responsive then you know put it straight on them but if you've got time and you think they're going to fight fight you with the with the the face mask then it's worth um you know putting on mum or dad first or putting it on a teddy bear or putting it you know just playing around a little bit yeah fantastic um, this is a really good point and something I really didn't know as a med student, um, the different types of um, airway uh, opening manoeuvres. Can someone speak to why we have different positions in different age groups? Maybe Jonathan? Um, I don't actually know, but I guess just trying to reason would be just at different ages, you have different size airways and whether or not the anatomy just changes over time would be my thought. Yeah, fantastic. So anatomical difference is, and for me, um, not being a, a great anatomy person, I don't know the exact difference. Lahiro for sure would, and um, it's something that I'll have to learn if I eventually get onto the PEDS program. But yeah, just different anatomical differences. So um, we start with a head tilt chin lift um, with, with an infant. So we're just keeping it very, very neutral. And then in a older child, we start with a sniffing position, which you have to kind of Google because it doesn't really make sense in my opinion, but they say sniffing the morning air. So you put a pillow um, underneath uh, the head to try and encourage them to have more. Um, I can feel this one, James. Yeah. So yeah. Neck extension. I love that um, logic got you there, Jonathan. Because essentially, you're right. It's totally anatomy. It's anatomical. Um, the, he the difference between adults and kids is the fact that uh, a, a big difference anatomically is the head doesn't change too much in size, whereas the body grows disproportionately to an adult size and so in an infant and you know neonates like their head is big enough that the, when the when the, pa the baby is just lying there they're already in this optimal position now the optimal position if you ever write this so write this down because it'd be something to look for the you know kind of look up is a three axis model so if you think of these three axes you've got your oral axis which goes straight back then you've got your pharyngeal axis which is slightly you know more rounded around the back there and then your tracheal axis, which is where your trachea is, none of those axes align. So air has to flow in a bit of a U shape or a horseshoe. By pushing, by having the, uh, the mastoid process in line with the sternal angle in an adult and children, that just lines up the axial, enables the lining up of the axis better. So, you know, the younger the child, the more it's already aligned simply because the head is large. Whereas in adults, you need to kind of lift it forward and that helps line up that tracheal axis with the oral axis and pharyngeal axis. So that's pretty much it. A whole bunch of fancy terms to just make a right a, a horseshoe a bit more linear. 
Awesome. Um, so yeah, so just remembering that there's different positions. So um, as med students, you're probably not, and even as an intern myself, I'm probably not going to be in charge of the airway in a um, cardiac arrest, but something to be worth knowing. Um, so when we are in the position, we, we know what to do. Um, so as you can see, the airways follow the, the O's and there's one more O. Does anyone know the last O? Uh, Tina? I'm not really sure. That's um, okay. We haven't really like removed any like secretions or anything, so but I can't think of an O word that goes with that. <laughs> that's that's actually really good. We need we need another O for that. And I actually don't have that here. So um yeah, fantastic. Suction suctioning is what I wasn't looking for, but I would love to put that um, on the slide. Um, anyone for the for the another O? Actually, just go for James because it's a, yeah, it, it will be a, not a tr tried and tested mnemonic. Go for so we'll be after this. I, I'm going to patent it. The four O's. So optimize. Um, so you may have seen some of the uh, adjunct airway adjuncts that um, the anaesthetist use, or if you've seen a cardiac arrest, they tend to you know try and get the tongue out of the way. For example, with the Goodell's airway. Um, and they come in different sizes. It's so worth knowing how you size it. So they use it from the angle of the mandible to the, um, to the, uh, the incisor. So um, have, a, have a Google and see what they look like or go through one of the um, operating rooms and ask one of your friendly anaesthetists. So moving on to Brie. And just to, and just to reiterate, like having a format for all of this is the difference. Like say you say everything that was written there um, the difference between a fantastic answer and, and, you know, just an above average or an average answer is the fact that you can have an order to it. So again, if your bosses or your supervisor are asking you, how would you optimize the airway? Learn these keywords because that's what we're looking for. List, you know, look and listen for signs of airway obstruction um, and then oxygenate to safe oxygenation above 94% with these devices and escalate as per, you know, whatever. Optimize the position. Um, and use adjuncts if necessary. By giving these frameworks, you just sound so polished rather mm. than just rattling off, you know, words um, without any particular order. So, um, yeah, really pay attention to the order, order James has given because that's a big part of it. Yeah, that's to be said about any, any answer. Um, a framework is really, really important. Okay, so going through breathing, the B of doctors ABCD. Zara, if you, someone had cleared the airway, they deemed it was patent, they were satting okay what would be your next approach to, to breathing? So um, with breathing, I would like to look, listen and feel. Um, <laughs> and also, uh, so looking for the um, rise and fall of the chest, um, listening with your stethoscope. Um, what else would I do? Um, yeah, pretty much um, seeing if there's um, fogging up of the airways and yeah, that's where I would start. Fantastic. So you mentioned you used your stethoscope. What are we going to be doing with our steth stethoscope? What are we listening for? So listening for uh, breath sounds. So and also the absence of breath sounds in in the case of a, a pneumothorax. Um, and listening for sounds like creps or wheezes. Um, and comparing it um, left to right as well. Yeah, beauty. That's really really good. Um, so you said look, listen and feel. So I think that's the most important thing we can do straight away to, to dictate whether we have time or not. Um, so looking to see if there's rise and fall of the chest, listening to see if there's breath sounds and then feeling the chest to see if there's rise and fall. And after we've got a bit of breathing, then we can take a bit of time and go through um, the rest of the, the respiratory system, if you like. Has, has anyone heard of a mnemonic um, that they like to use when assessing breathing? Tom, does Ray, okay. oh, Jeremy. Yeah, you go, Jeremy. Yeah, um, the pneumonic rates um, for listen, um, counting the respiratory rate, auscultating, mm -hmm. um, like what was mentioned already, um, seeing whether there's any tracheal tuck um, effort of breathing, and then uh, oxygen sets. So Beauty, nail nailed it. Um, so respiratory rate and knowing 
respiratory rates are tough or with all vital signs in peds they differ depending on the age so i guess having a rough idea but if you don't make sure you have the vitals chart nearby auscultating as zara said um and then tracheal tug or other signs of respiratory distress like tracheal deviation so these things are like you need to see them so either go into your um resus or google these things i hadn't seen tracheal tug until last week um it's pr and it's pretty it's very very obvious so we had a, um, a, a severe asthma attack in a I think she was 10 years of age and she had some severe tracheal tug. So that will stay with me. So make sure you Google that if you haven't seen, seen that. Um, efficacy and chest expansion and then O2 sats. So we can use O2 sats in airway, but also breathing. Um, any questions so far? Awesome. Um, so ventilating and supporting, um, so escalating, the, uh, the, risk, the breathing apparatus if we need. So Lahira might be able to speak more to this about um, our ventilating yeah. options. And, 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 you know, mnemonics are great, especially if everyone else knows it. And, I, you know, I'll be the first one to admit that's not everything. So uh, I think Tina was mentioning other stuff in there, like, you know, why wouldn't you look at fogging of the mask and things like that? Absolutely. It's just, it's just one of those things in medicine, this is what everyone says. Um, and so it's really great to be able to quickly put it out because you get your marks and it's very practical and you know, useful. Um, and at the point when suddenly you think that this is not good, then you right, you apply oxygen, you apply the bag valve mask, the Liddell bag, and then you ventilate, and then you assess other things like is the chest rising and falling in a you know wave pattern rather than paradoxical fashion or you know paradoxical breathing as a sign of obstruction, um, and is there fogging of the mask? And if you've got fancy monitor, is there an end tidal CO two? And you may constantly be told uh, by your supervisors that don't don't look at the sats necessarily for the efficacy of breathing because it's a late sign. So we've got saturations there, which is absolutely right because if you're not breathing, the sats will be low. Uh, but you you just want to be able to look at those early signs, which is lack of rise and fall of the chest, fogging, and then support their ventilation if required. Yeah, great. And at this point in time, if you if they're breathing, the airways paint, and you've got some time. A lot of the problems that you see in the PZD, for example, are respiratory based. So having a differential after you've assessed, assessed breathing. So, you know, do they have a foreign body? Are they asthmatic? Are they anaphylactic? Is it bronchiolitis? Is it croup? So having like a few key points per differential diagnosis. So you can be like, okay, I think this is croup, but let's go through circulation. Let's go through disability and exposure, and then we can manage um croup if it's if it's if you if you've got time if you don't go, don't have time um treat as you go um so here are a few differentials and these are really they love testing these you know med school exams so um feel free to take a screenshot of this one and uh, they're the important differentials to to be aware of all righty any questions on breathing guys Cool, we'll move on to circulation. So I'm gonna pick on Michael. Yeah, I'm here, yep. Hey mate, um, so we've, we've assessed airway, we've assessed breathing and we're on to circulation. What, what kind of things do you wanna look out for in a, in, a pay, in a PED patient? Yeah, look, my algorithms look, feel, listen. Um, wanna look at that color, and make sure they're not going blue. Um, look for external bleeding. Um, look and see if there's any signs of internal bleeding, swelling, distension, obvious bruises, and have a look at the urine output. Um, I want to have a listen for their heart sounds. And I want to have a feel for central and peripheral pulses, um, central capillary fill uh, to, as a measure of perfusion. Um, that's kind of how I think about it. That was awesome, man. Yeah, that, that was, you nailed that. You, I don't think you missed out on anything. And with the central capillary refill, how do you do that? Um, I go up a sternum, just firmly press in and expect color to come back within two seconds. Awesome. And how long do you press down for? At least five seconds. Oh, you're nailing it, nailing it. Cool. So um, going through heart rate uh, and rhythm, completely refill time, so less than two seconds, as Michael said. Skin temperature, blood pressure. Um, and blood pressure is one of those things that is really helpful, but I would say one third of patients on the paid ward get it. And that's only because it's really difficult to get it. Kids hate, hate it so that we don't get it. So 
and it's also a very very late sign so if we're waiting for the patient to become hypertensive we've probably waited too long kids compensate really well until they um, at this point try and get iv or io access and give fluid which will go through shortly io access seems really really rogue until you see it it's it's really really common if you can't establish a line which isn't that um easy in a dehydrated um, neonate where you kind of can you know see a vein or, or feel a vein so here's just um some values that are normal um royal children's uh, hospital has really really good, good guidelines and there's heaps on the on the net but if you are going on your peds water i recommend saving this as a photo and putting it as like a home or lock screen um because it's just so complex because um the other one i commonly use is just a pd stat or pd safe app and it's got all the ranges on that as well but yeah really hard to memorize this stuff and that's one of the reasons why peds is so challenging in anesthetics every drug every instrument every airway adjunct is just always different sizes and I, I don't trust my memory with that i'm just going to look it up and uh, make sure i've got that on hand 100 percent. here do you mind putting that in the chat the the app i might actually download that myself after yeah sorry i'll do that now cheers so going through disability so um who who would like to have a go at this one actually james i'll get you to go through disability and exposure just in the interest of time yeah, uh, then we'll ask um, everyone else the other, other stuff in fluids and analgesia. Cool. So going through conscious level, which um, in adult land, you probably do GCS, but in um, paid land, just because it's a bit hard to get a GCS of a kid that can't talk, for example, we do ABPU, so alert to voice, pain or unresponsive. Um, so yeah, that's just a really gross overview. Um, pupils, making sure they're uh, equal and reactive, Taking a BGL, don't ever forget glucose, really, really important. Looking at their gross motor, uh, seeing if there's any weakness um, and if that's focal or generalized and then their posture. So if they're floppy or they're stiff um, and then the stiff, you can then um, differentiate into decerebrate uh, and decorticate, um, which is just different parts of neurology in the brain that have been affected. Um, and doing a gross uh, assessment of hydration status, um, which, as Michael said before, includes urine output, skin turgor, mucous membranes, capillary refill time, um, just to note a few. Hydration is one of those things you see in PDD all the time. For those that are at Western, I reckon a third of the patients came in with some sort of gastro um, we, and de were dehydrated, so we had to differ we had to decide whether they were for iv fluids or not which we'll go through just going through exposure quickly so um, temperature so are they febrile afebrile or are they hypothermic um, hypothermia is a bit more common in neonates than it is in older children but can be a sign of sepsis so making sure you're aware of the temperatures looking for any rashes so the viral xenanthems or uh yeah or uh, any bacterial causes such as meningococcal. Um, any bruising, which may indicate low platelets or um, non-accidental injuries, which is another topic in itself. Um, any surgical scars that will give you an idea of pathology. If they've got an appendicectomy scar and they've got right iliac fossa pain, probably not appendicitis. Um, and then just looking at other things as well. Awesome. So we'll go through analgesia. Um, Cindy, have you got any, have you seen, um, any kids get any analgesia? Have you got any ideas of broad categories or how would you approach analgesia in a, in a kid? Yeah. Well, starting with simple analgesia, so paracetamol and ibuprofen, um, and then going on to like intranasal fentanyl, it's coming in the PDD. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I've seen all of those used in the intranasal fentanyl so used last week on a kid who had dislocated his shoulder. So that, that was pretty cool to see and how, how quick it works. Um, if we were to go through the two broad categories, so you've, you've given me one category. Do you know the other category, Cindy? It's not as difficult as, as you think it, it may be. Opioids? Yep, so you've given me another great answer. So you've just given me pharmacological. What about the other side? 
um, non-pharmacological. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was kind of, guess what I'm thinking. Um, I think I do the exact same. I want to jump to like the medicine knowledge, but non-pharmacological is just as important in paid land as pharmacological um, if, you, if you can get away with it. Um, Matt, uh, what are the routes of delivery? Um, so we've got oral. Um, I haven't seen much pediatric analgesia, so obviously like intranasal as well. Um, and then I'd say IV would probably be a late, late step in the, in the analgesia route. Yeah, beauty. Yeah, you too right. So um, as, as Matt said, we've got oral, we've got IN, uh, we've got topical, we've got IV, kind of all the routes of delivery that you use for, for adults. But I guess we kind of try and start with oral if we can um, and uh, wait for IV as a last resort, whereas every patient in adult land gets a cannula mostly. Um, this is kind of guess what I'm thinking, but has anyone seen any resources on the wards that are commonly used for dosage, dosages? Our hospital has um, guidance charts on the walls in the doctor's room for different dosages of anesthetics and also antibiotics as well. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I, Lahura was telling me about uh, that little book. What's that book called? Frank yes, Dr Drug Doses by Frank Shan. So this is, uh, there's only a couple of apps I use all the time and it's Frank Shan's Drug Doses uh, as well as, um, you know, Medscape as well as, uh, what's, an, what's another one? Definitely the PD State, PD Safe app when I'm doing uh, peds and stuff. Um, but yeah, that app I would use all the time because it's great for peds and adults. It's got all the kind of standard dosing um, and it's kind of like what we used to always carry around in this, in this small pamphlet that every single anesthetist and most doctors use as well. And now um, it's on an app, so really useful. Yeah. And the race, uh, on every recess cart at Western, at least, they have the Monash um, drug book, which has uh, every, like has weight from you know, zero kilos to like 50 kilos. And you just open to that page and it gives you the dose um, immediately. So you don't have to even think about it. Um, this is guess what I'm thinking, but Tina, two important things to know before giving any kid analgesia. Um, their weight, I would assume. Yes, um, very good. I actually haven't done peds yet, but um, I guess any allergies. Oh, yes. Okay, go, sure. Go you. <laughs> Great. So moving on to non-pharmacological. So um, as mum's doing here to baby, uh, parental distraction um just having presence there keeping them close and then distracting them with feeding it's it's magical to see you can just give a kid a piece of food and their eyes light up and they forget what's even happening it's great it's kind of like me when you give me some ice cream I, I could anything could happen and then we'll go to the pharmacological so um starting with sucrose so um does anyone know how sucrose works or what sucrose even is smoothie Uh, I'm not sure, but sucrose is a is a type of sugar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm so just that would work as an anesthetic. Yeah, yeah. So it's an analgesia, so not an anesthetic, but it just it just stimulates um, dopamine receptors, like it does with us. You know, when we have lollies or ice cream, and um, they the dopamine centers go go nuts. So. We try and use this for, I guess, simple procedures in in younger kids. It doesn't really work or doesn't have proven evidence in older kids. You're welcome to try it. Um, and it comes in like pre-made, um, not satchels, but like things that you can just put straight in the kid's mouth and they can suck on it. So it's great. Um, and then going through to simple analgesia, so paracetamol. Um, and this isn't as simple as, you know, one gram QID. You have to get go by the weight. Um, so as Tina was saying before, you need the weight um, of, a, of a kid. So if you can, as soon as they go to the cubicle, get the weight on the way. That's like really, really helpful. Um, and you can give ibuprofen as well, 10 milligrams per kilo TDS. Um, so the next line, uh, Jeremy, where would you go next after, you know, you've given a dose of paracetamol and ibuprofen, it doesn't seem to be working. 
you've given an hour and they're still reporting pain or you know they're grimacing where do you go to next I'll consider opioids opioids yeah cool uh -huh. what are, what what were you thinking what opioid um they're assessing the contraindications can give except morphine Say that again, sorry. After assessing the contraindications, can I consider morphine? Yeah, mor morphine, yeah. Uh, yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah, great. So I guess it depends on what route you on what route you want to give it. So I guess if we're if we're happy with an oral, we'll probably stick with oxycodone. If we want to go, you know, IV, maybe morphine and IN fentanyl. Um, does anyone know one uh uh opioid that we want to avoid in kids? Mason. Someone's put in the chat. Is it coding? Yes, whoever said that, go you. Lahiru, can you remind me why? I think I, I felt like I knew earlier today, but now I forgot. Yeah. Why do we avoid yeah, coding? Actually, actually um, whoever answered that, do you know why? We try to avoid codeine and even tramadol, we have to use with a bit of caution. Um, I think it's something to do with the way they metabolize it. Absolutely. They metabolizes or something. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of drugs, you know how drugs are either, they, you, know, you put a drug into the body and the drug acts on a receptor. That's a really simplistic effect of a drug and receptor. But some drugs are these things called pro-drugs. So it's the, you know, when we give the drug, it's actually that drug we give isn't exerting the effect. And there's so many drugs like this. For example, paracoxib is a pro-drug. Even morphine has pro-drug qualities. It metabolizes into a more potent drug, M6G and M3G. Um, and then you've got drugs like tramadol, which get metabolized into another drug, which acts on opioid receptors. Same with codeine. Codeine has effects by itself, which is essentially constipation and antitussive, um, and maybe a really weak analgesic effect, but then codeine gets metabolized into morphine, um, which then acts on the morphine receptors or opioid receptors. And as soon as you chuck that extra pathway in, it might be great for delivery of certain drugs, um, just for you know pharmaceutical reasons, but it also adds an extra complexity that, oh dear, what's, um, you know, in this particular patient with their genomic variability and their odd liver function, who knows what's going to happen? And so we do find problems in kids with, uh, you know, just variation, vari variability of this. And it's there, there's probably an idea that it's not actually more variable than adults, but kids have far less reserve. So suddenly a little bit of opioid that is converted far faster suddenly causes respiratory depression. So you, you just want to be more careful in general in kids. So that's why there's a bit of a warning for codeine and, and tramadol. Cool. In my three weeks working as an intern on the PEDS ED ward, I saw I saw endone or oxycodone prescribed like once or twice. So really probably the kids um, with kids with more debilitating conditions, probably more often, but I rarely saw it. Um, so there's just the dose for oxycodone. Um, that's a safe dose. RCH says uh, 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 for, for neonates um, or young kids, and then 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 for um, older kids. So if you just remember 0 0.1, smack bang in the middle. And so, uh, you know, what I really love about this, it's, it's so important, like, you know, when you become interns, these are, these are the things that you end up writing up time and time again. Obviously now we've got the EMR, which makes it a lot easier, but I just had a cheat sheet. Um, maybe for your exams, it's far more important for you to memorize some of these doses. Just have that cheat sheet, make sure that you know how to write these things out and exactly what you're writing out. Milligrams per kilogram, QID, oral, IV, whatever it is, and just rehearse that. Get used to write it, helping out your um, interns on the wards to write up these common things. Cool. So going through some final tips, we've probably been through all these points, but um, oh, except for this one. So if you think a kid needs uh, an IV, whether that be for, for fluid or for analgesia or for, for other meds, apply Emla cream. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen Emla cream, but it's just to uh, ask the nurses for it and they can give it to you. And then you just put it on the um, tegaderm, which is the uh, IV cannula sticky tape type of thing. Um, and you put it over the cube boss uh, and the, the dorsum of, of both hands. So you wait 30, 40 minutes and then you can take it off and it's just like a local little anesthetic and um, kids will love you for it. Yeah, actually, any, just a question for anyone. Does anyone know what EMLA stands for? Bit of a random question.
Now that's completely, I only learned this for my part primary exam, eutetic mixture of local anesthetics. If you're doing really well in your exams, they might ask you this. And it just means <laughs> that this is a really specific mixture where they clump the local anesthetic in these really highly concentrated balls <laughs> or, you know, little spheres. And because it's highly concentrated, it means that the local anesthetic goes from a high concentration gradient to a low concentration gradient through the skin much faster. So yeah, eutetic mixture of local anesthetic. There you go. There's a, there's a fact to, to woo your friends and family. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Impress, impress your mates. <laughs> um, oh, this is really important as well. So asking your parents when they last give gave their simple analgesia. So it's common for parents to give Panadol before before the kid comes to the ED, let's say they've, they've had a fever and you don't want to give too much. So asking when the last dose was given. Um, we've already mentioned this, really, really important. Um, and then if they're a little baby, just making sure you get a dry weight to take off all their goodies. Um, asking about allergies and then considering topical analgesia. So this is just um, a little point, just topical lignocaine for tartus media, making sure they don't have a rupture. Um, and then immobilizing limbs and applying grass principles for injuries. So not everything needs a tablet. And I just want to go back to the fact that um, if, you, if you go back to that slide on analgesia. Uh, back, couple back slides. again. Yeah. This is maybe one more slide back. Sorry. Yeah, just, just to kind of highlight this point about giving big categories and, and you've all been doing it really well. Just know that when, um, when you, you'll often get asked either a broad question or a specific question. If you ask a specific question, like, you know, what's the, you know, the, you know, dose of paracetamol, great. You just answer it with 15 milligrams per kilogram. That's easy, it's transparent. But often anesthetists or consultants, pediatricians, whatever, they will ask you broad questions. And your ability to get them on side is your ability to know the categories. And even if you don't know the categories, you still sound smart if you just say something like a category. And in this situation, it was easy to, for you to come up with that, right? It was pharmacological or non-farm, conservative or invasive. Um, one of the questions they asked me in my exam was what are the kinds of induction agents? And I was like, oh, I don't actually have a classification for this. And I was like, okay, they're your barbiturates and your non-barbiturates. You can always come up with something, but it helps you to show a broad perspective of things. ABCD is an example of that. Um, you know, so you don't miss out on anything. You don't miss out on the fact that you would not only would you immobilize the limb and have distraction therapy and sucrose and other non-farm stuff, then you'd start with a multimodal analgesia. So yeah, just one of those things that consultants love and examiners will definitely be asking about. Back to you, James. Thank you. So that's analgesia. Does anyone have any questions on analgesia in a kid? I had a question about Emla stuff. I've seen on a kid who's, you know, very scared of needles, having the little, the white cream on the, both of the back of the dorsum of the hand and the anterior mm. fossa, they had like four of these things on them. Mm. Just wondering if, um, you know, if there's any, that, like the local uh, anesthetic systemic toxicity, especially if you're a small little kid with, you know, four, yeah. maybe even more <laughs> little sides, is that a consideration? That's a really good question. So you shouldn't have it for more, on for more than an hour. It's very, very unlikely to cause toxicity if you, you know, uh, you know, you put a reason that you would never bathe the person in EMLA and you wouldn't put on mucous membranes lightly. Um, and if so, you'd only put on, you know, very uh, occasional sites, maybe if that, I'm not even sure if you're allowed to put on mucous membranes. So just correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but the most you'd put it on is anticubular fossa and um, your, um, you know, the dorsum of the hand. That is enough. If you, would you put it on a kid who is, not aware, probably not. So we're not often putting it on the less than, you know, six months of age kind of kids. Um, if so, you know, maybe maybe we're doing it for a very limited amount of time as well. Um, but yeah, that, that, would, that would be my suggestion for that. Yeah, that's really good. And I guess in a, in a kid, in a neonate, they're gonna cry whether they can feel it or not. If you're grabbing their hand, um, they're probably gonna pull away and not like it anyway. So yeah, um, but good question, really good question. So going through fluid management. Um, so this is this is this is where the money's at, and I feel like this is what all the pediatricians love to teach about. Um, so before we start, does anyone have a framework to um, let's say our kids come in with looks they look dehydrated or clinically they look dehydrated? Um, does anyone have a framework of what what goes through their mind? Maybe let's go Mason.
move on to Catherine. And just quickly, I've just put a website page article uh, just kind of showing you a whole bunch of good information about that very particular question. Um, so less than three months of age, no evidence for except circumcision. Um, and yeah, you've got some maximum dosages and stuff as well. Uh, yeah, that's about it. So I keep going. Back to you, Catherine. Yeah, uh, so you may assess the severity of the dehydration first and then uh, do history of examination and then uh, supply them it with uh, oral fluid therapy or IV. I'm not too sure. Yeah, that's, good. No, that, that's really good. What's your, what's your threshold for oral versus IV then? When do you say, okay, this, this patient's probably too sick for, for oral or we don't have enough time or, okay, let's try oral first. Do you have like a, a cutoff in your, in your head? Not really. Haven't done my piece rotation yet. No, that, that's so fine. Um, I, there's probably algorithms that you can follow to say, okay, no, this patient needs IV. But really what I've experienced, and it's obviously a very limited time as well, is they kind of, it's very variable based on, you know, the patient's presentation, the patient's past history, um, and obviously the clinical signs of dehydration. So if they're severely dehydrated and they're showing signs of shock, we probably don't have enough time to encourage oral intake and we'll go straight to IV. But if you've got time, um, we always like to try oral first. So as Catherine said, assess for dehydration. Um, so we need to weigh the child. Uh, that's really, really important. So trying to get a dry weight, um, as I said, on the way to the cubicle, because that will dictate how much fluid we give. Checking UECs, so electrolytes um, and renal function and glucose initially. Um, and RCH loves doing it daily. Remember daily, daily, daily. Um, I should have asked what the bolus dose is. If anyone didn't say that, uh, Chelsea, how much, uh, what's the bolus dose for, for a kid? Um, sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I think it's a fixed dose according to their weight for everyone. But yeah, I can't remember the number, sorry. That's okay, what's it? What seems yeah, what seems reasonable? Um I 20, 20 mil per kilogram. Oh yeah, awesome awesome. Bang. So yeah, 10, 10 to 20. So again, it depends on the consultant that's in charge. It depends how sick they are. But yeah, if they're if they're pretty sick, we'll give them 20, 20 mil per kilo. So that's why you need the weight and then you can just go bang. Um and Chelsea, why are you on a roll? Do you know the fluid of choice for a bolus? Yep. So we just do normal, sa normal saline. Fantastic. Um, awesome. Um, so, and then we need to know the, the fluid deficit. So, um, which we'll go through shortly. So uh, once you've done with the bolus, then you can kind of calculate the maintenance rate and the deficit rate, and then you add the two which we'll, we'll go through. Okay, so we're just gonna uh, go through a little, bit, little bit of a case to try and ingrain these calculations um, for you guys. So let's pick Jimmy. So Jimmy weighs 25 kilos and he's deemed to be 5% dehydrated. Um, all righty, so does anyone, what we just went through the 10 to 20 mil per kilo, Chelsea, you might as well answer. What bolus dose would we give um, Jimmy? Yep, so we would give 2,500 to 500 mil of bolus. Yep, so yeah, 250 to 500. So depending on whatever your consultant um, prefers, whether it's the 10 to 20, fantastic. Um, we'll go through the fluid deficit, but uh, does anyone know the calculation off the top of their head? If not, we'll go through it on it on in a couple of slides time. No worries, we'll go through that. Um, does anyone know the rule to calculate fluid maintenance? Four, two, one rule. Awesome. Is that is that what what frequency is that for? Uh, um, so you do four mils per kilo for the first ten kilos. Is that what 
if you're sort of asking. Yeah, 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 perfect. Yeah, so four mils per, per kilo for the first 10 kilos, then two mils per kilo for the next 10 kilos, and every kilogram after that is one kilo. Beauty. And is that one mil per kilo? Yeah, and is that per hour or per 24 hour? That is per hour. Beauty. Love it. Um, and then while you're on a roll, does that change if Jimmy's unwell? Um, it depends what he's unwell with. So something like respiratory or neurological, you're worried Beauty. about um, SIADH. So you'd go roughly two thirds maintenance. Well done. Beauty. That's exactly right. Cool. So now we'll go through the calculations just to really um, ingrain it. So, oh, whoops, I didn't put, my bad. We've already been through this. This one's probably one of the easier ones. So as I said, 10 to 20 mil per kilo, Jimmy weighs 25 kilos. So 25 times 10 or 25 times 20 to get your bolus dose there. Remembering normal saline, 0.9%. Um, so going through the next fluid deficit. Um, so there's two formulas that we can use for fluid deficit. So we can use the pre-morbid weight. So if they've been in recently or, you know, they're admitted to the ward, we can use their, their weight that their parents report that when they're healthy to their current weight and times by a thousand, or which is not always, especially in the ED, you're not going to get a pre-morbid weight. So we can use their current weight times their percent of dehydration. So Jimmy's five, uh, with Dainty's 5%. And RCH have really, really good guidelines on the differing um, percentages. So someone who who's shocked is roughly 10%, for example, and you times that by 10. So um, I'll ask, somebody I haven't asked yet. Um, I've asked you, Michael, I'll ask you again, Michael. Um, what, what would that fluid deficit um, volume be for, for Jimmy? Uh, 500 mils? From my uh, my mass wrong. <laughs> yeah, so that's right. So 25 times five, which is 125. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Times 10. So 1.25. Exactly, 1.25. Awesome. Um, and then do you know what frequency we get that over? Is it an hour? Is it over 24 hours, 48 hours? I think over 24 hours. Yeah, great. So RCH says 24 to 48, but I think... 24 makes sense, especially if we're calculating the maintenance rate as well. Awesome, so you just said this. Great, so now we need to calculate the maintenance rate. Um, so was it you, Matt, before it was going through 421? Yeah. Sorry, sorry yeah. James, just a question. Yeah. Um, how did you get to the 5% dehydration status? Is it sort of clinical judgment or is there like a actual measurement that you do objectively? Yeah, so it's all clinical science. So RCH, um, will, so they categorize it into mild, moderate, and severe. So mild is less than 5%, um, moderate is 5 to 10%, and then severe is greater than 10% dehydrated. So these are all clinical signs based on, let's say, heart rate. So someone with moderate or severe might be profoundly tachycardic. Um, blood pressure, someone with severe, so greater than 10% will be hypotensive. Um, they're related to their alertness. So someone with, you know, mild might be alert and then you might get someone with severe who's only alert to voice or pain. Um, so if you type in RCH fluid um, or fluid calculations. I'll, I'll put it in the, I'll put it in the chat. So this is a great little document. Um, but again, it's really rough, right? Like, so, you know, clinical signs are terrible, but this is kind of just the best guide to it. And just know that no matter how good you are as a clinician, you just make a bit of a guess. And most people probably fall into the moderate dehydration. You know, if you're markedly shocked, you get some serious signs. You give that trial fluid and you reassess. Give it fluid, reassess. You're constantly reassessing um, and seeing how people are going. So that, that's the key to it. You give fluid, reassess. Um, but that link there will give you uh, the fluid, the dehydration guidelines and the one associated with that as a fluid guideline. So again, really great resource. I haven't seen resources like this, like you know, world, world standard resources. Yeah, RCH, RCH, everything you need to know about PEDS, RCH has some sort of guideline on it. Um, but good, great question. Um, so Matt, fluid maintenance. So you said 421, do you know the 24 hour rule? 
Um, is it you reassess every 24 hours? So you yes. check, yeah, check going, weight sorry. and electrolytes 24 hours? Yeah, awesome. Um, and then RCH says do it more frequently if, if they're sicker. So if you wanted to calculate the rate for the hour, um, so you, I guess you can just times what you calculated the 421 rule by 24. But have you heard of the 150 20 rule? No, I haven't. Yeah, so I guess it's just as similar as doing 421 and then timesing it by 24 hours. Um, but you can do 150 20 uh, for the same kilos. So we'll go through uh, Jimmy's example. So, um, Matt, if we were doing 24 hours of fluid maintenance for Jimmy, um, what value, what, how much volume would you give him? Um, so we do 100 by 10 for the first 10 kilos. So 1,000 plus then 50 by 10, so 500, and then 20 by 5, so 100. So 2,600 mils per 24 hours. Uh, so, so you said 1,000? Yep. And then 500? Yep. And then 100, so oh, 1,600. 1,600, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah your, your math was perfect until... You just you, da you doubled Until it. So I just I slipped up <laughs> the first hurdle. Um, great. So yeah, sixteen hundred. Great. And then we need to add the maintenance. So does anyone remember what the maintenance was? Sorry, the deficit. So we've got the maintenance, and now we need to add the deficit to it. So which was twelve fifty. Mm. So. So you give almost three liters over that 24 hours. Fantastic. Okay, moving on. So, uh, Jonathan, what what's our preferred route of fluid administration? Uh, we would want to be doing oral if they could tolerate it, uh, or perhaps even nasogastric um, if you're having trouble with finding IV or IO, or just I think there'd be certain indications where you'd want to do that. Yeah. So I think oral is enteral. Beauty. Good answer. Uh, so this is kind of think, guess what I'm thinking, but Jonathan, if they're not tolerating oral and you kind of you're a bit hesitant to try NGT, um, if, is there any medication that you could think may may help with nausea, for example? Uh, with nausea, I mean anti-nausea medications is uh, I guess things like ondansetron uh use more in adults i'm uncertain if some of these things are safe in kids though so I'd, yeah. I, would, I would check yeah that's, great. that's a great answer so I, yeah i was kind of unsure as well and then they you they give on danzatron just almost just as frequently as simple analgesia so um four milligrams for most kids and then two milligrams for the, for the smaller kids just um a wafer so it just dissolves um and then they may tolerate oral uh, intake uh, so we've said the preferred fluid is 0.9% normal saline um, and Matt nailed this on its head. So we just beware SIADH. So we don't want to make them hyponatremic. Um, and then, uh, and if we see that their UECs are deranged, what should we do as med students or even as an intern? Uh, escalate to someone more senior. Great. That's that's what I wanted. Awesome. So yes, speak oh, to you, senior. That, that was great. And, and so the first thing is um, just with that fluid chapter. Just just um, again in terms of categorization, I think that first answer someone said was, you know, how do you assess it? Absolutely. You know, if they're doctors A B C D, you assess if they're unwell, and that gives you a you know a bit of a um, idea of their fluid deficit. But otherwise, the answer to every assessment is history, examination, investigations, and then your approach and method is to essentially these three things there's your deficit your maintenance and then your ongoing losses so those three categories is how you'll approach everything so imagine in the exam you get asked this question that's what you write down and just practice you know getting a percent deficit and you know i, I suspect that in most exams and most kids who aren't you know resus status uh it'll be five percent or something easy with maths <laughs> so you know you calculate that deficit and be able to replace that with a logical manner like 10 mils per kilo reassess calculate your maintenance and then they've got ongoing losses like pyloric stenosis that keeps vomiting you got to replace those losses as well so just whatever you do make sure you answer within those categories and that's how you get, get all your marks um 
Yeah, well, look, um, just in the interests of time, we won't we won't be able to do the sedation one in this section, but we'll definitely do that in a, at another time. Um, so we'll just put up another another thing where we get to do a bit more sedation stuff and a bit more advanced airway stuff potentially. Um, yeah, James, keep going. Awesome. So you wanted me to skip this one? Yeah, we'll just go to the uh, to the end now. And uh, thanks. Um, So um, yeah. Any any questions about any of that for myself or James? I have a question on the um, so like a child in shock, the bolus. Mm. What makes you decide whether it's ten or twenty mils per kilo? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a really good question, and I suspect that a, a bit of log logic there. For example, if this patient was a massive hemorrhage, volume loss, trauma type situation, I wouldn't hesitate at just giving twenty. You'd know that there's at least, you know, have a much blood that's that's gone where you can see it on the on the clothes, you can see it from the ambulance notes or whatever it is, I wouldn't hesitate at that. But if it was a dehydrated patient and it's happened a bit more chronically, um, then I'd probably just give 10 mils per kilo and then keep reassessing. You're very safe to say keep reassessing because that's literally what we do. And any consultant who's supervising you would be like, yeah, that sounds reasonable because you can always give another 10 um, after you give them the first 10. Um, and literally, you know, stat bolus dosing of stuff doesn't happen like that. It happens over 15 minutes, over half an hour. So yeah, that, that's probably how I do it. Just, just logic. If you think that there's definitely that amount lost, just give the 20 mils per kilo. It's, it, it, it's very safe. Thanks. Any other questions? How common is SIDH from fluid therapy? That's a really good question. I, I, I don't know the rate of it. Um, I've, I haven't done enough PIDs over a long period of time to see the rates in chronic cases. Like in anesthetics, we just we, we often just see the patients in a very short time frame. So I'm not sure of that answer, but if anyone else has a good answer for that, please chime in or add in the chat. Yeah, I don't think it's super common. I think it's more of a theoretical risk um, rather than a, a one that comes to uh, reality quite often. Um, but I guess they're pretty, you go to the PIDs ward and you read some of the PIDs notes and they're, they're pretty... Uh, consistent with giving two thirds maintenance to anyone who they think is unwell, whether that be respiratory or neurological, um, they they don't hesitate to give two thirds maintenance. Any I had a question, other? perhaps about the the maintenance fluids. I, I understand that like at different ages you use you add glucose. Um, I was just wondering, you know, like the four two one rule or whatever some of these other little tips and tricks is there any easy way to remember how much glucose you need at different ages yeah so typically neonate is 10 percent glucose and then every other kid is um five percent uh glucose added to your normal saline so really really young kids get 10 percent and then everyone else gets five percent got it thank you cool any other questions team I'm happy to put my email, put my email in the chat. Um, and if you want to email me any questions or ask me anything about internship or, or med school or whatever, I'm happy to answer those questions. Yes, I'm just going to quickly share another screen. Um, Want me um, to stop sharing? Oh, no, that's oh, right. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, feel, please give some feedback. Um, if there's anything you want to change from this style of lecture just yeah just even if you don't answer all the questions that's fine just get, get up on their screen uh, use that qr code to give some feedback and we'll try to um yeah optimize this for yeah for what for uh, the next time that we give this kind of session if there's anything else you'd like please add that into the comments um and i find that if i don't do if i don't do a um uh, if i don't give the feedback right now while i'm here at the computer um i just don't end up doing so please feel free to do it right now and uh, yeah let us know what you would like to see in future and anything we could do to make it better Thank you. Um, we'll stay around for a couple of, maybe you know, like five more minutes. So if anyone has any questions, um, we'll stay around for a bit longer. So feel free to ask while we're just um, hanging out. I had another question if no one else is going to jump in just regarding um, considering constipation in kids what laxatives or you know periods would you think to give in a child 
what have you seen here? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So again, um, I, I like to keep this exam focused as well as real life. Um, but just know that a lot of the, uh, whenever you give an opioid, it should be an automatic prescription to laxatives and anti-nausea. So again, in the exam, this is this is very, uh, you know, incisive and shows that you've got some clinical knowledge. So whatever you do, make sure you give both of those. To answer your question about laxatives, almost every patient that I'd have on an opioid would have lactulose. I've got the adult doses here, so forgive me for giving these doses. Just look up the other ones. But lactulose, twenty mils. Um, BD oral for every patient on opioids, and then Coloxal and Senna, two tablets, BD, PRN, um, and then finally Movicol, one sachet, uh, PRN daily. And your aim is that every patient, every single time, you should have a bowel action at least once a day. And if they've gone without a bowel action for you know, two days, that's a problem. Um, in the adult world, I'm not, you know, I've got less experience in the pediatric ward world. In the adult world, it's such a big deal, you know, uh, uh, yeah, constipation that causes, you know, really bad stuff happening, like bowel obstructions, requiring manual disimpactions, and then, or, you know, the, the, the septic effects of that is just such a big deal in elderly patients that you want to be so on top of that as a junior doctor. Um, so, yeah, even as medical students, look at the chart, make sure that each patient on opioids has those things written up as well. There's a, there's a chocolate formula called Parachoc, but apparently it tastes awful. So I th I'd probably stick to Lahira's um, recommendations. Also constipation RCH guideline is really, really helpful. Mason has a really good question about Emily cream and why we put it on all four surfaces. Um, so I guess that's for when you take it off and uh, you can't find a good vein or you, know, you have a go on the dorsum of the hand and you miss, and then you're like, oh no, I've got, I haven't applied Emla anywhere else. What am I gonna do? And then you've got to wait another 40 minutes to apply EMLA. So just, I guess it's prophylactically putting them all there. So just in case you miss. That's, that's, uh, that's a great point. There was um, one of the worst things is that the patient comes down with EMLA just on the hands and there's no veins on the hands. Uh, so I, I, like, I'm like, oh, all the point of doing that whole thing is just gone. So really, if, if you can, if you see a couple of good veins, just two sites is fantastic, especially if they're coming down to the theater or something. But yeah, if, if Sometimes, you know, if you've got one really good vein, even that's easy to miss, especially if you're a junior, even if you're a senior. So having at least two sites, but if you're coming down to the theater, it can be so much trickier with the whole interactions and everything. And the patient who's now in theater and it looks scary. So yeah, I usually just say four sites. And another great question. Uh, you add the fluid deficit to maintenance totals and then divide this over 24 hours. Is this glucose volume included or separate? Separate. Uh, so that's a, that's a good question. So when you think about the glucose, that's literally for, so first of all, uh, my, my experience is perioperative and often people in the short time frame of being nil oral don't need glucose, especially adults. Kids, it is different. And generally you'll give this kind of stronger 10% solution to avoid the big volume. So, uh, so when I, when I give, you know, when, when, I, when you give glucose at 10%, that volume is not going to stay in the intravascular space at all. So you probably have it as separate. Um, and again, I'm just, I just say this cautiously because I haven't recently been giving young kids glucose. So it um, might be best to ask, ask someone, someone um, in a pizza environment. James, do you have a good answer for that? Um, I was, so it's added to the maintenance, right? So that, um, we said that 1250 is the deficit. So the six, the 1600 was the maintenance rate. So that's added, I guess, per, per bag. Um, so yeah, I, th I thought it was included, but um, I've and never actually seen it practically being given because that's what the nurses do. And I'll, I'll um, find an answer for you for that. Okay. So if you send me an email to abcs of anesthesia at gmail.com, um, I'll be able to get, get an answer. I might even send out the answer to everyone. I just have a very quick question about mm. pediatric cannulation as well. Yeah. I've seen like lights being used to trying to locate a vein. Is that like exclusively for pediatrics or, and do we like Virtually. use ultrasound as well? Essentially uh, adult hand has just too many layers of tissue. So shining a light in most adults just doesn't go through the skin. So you can't see the vessels there. Um, but yeah, in pediatrics, most young kids, you can shine a light and you can see all the, uh, 
the um, shadows of the veins and that's perfect. You just aim at that shadow and suddenly you've got a visible vein, like a, big, a huge battle with kids, especially in that kind of less than two years old is the chubbiness. So it's just really hard to see veins. Uh, so yeah, having that light on, I can now see a target and I can go for that. Yep, that makes sense. Thank you. Some of the some of the page regs just carry like that light in the back of their pocket. So when they're especially on neonates, it's really, really helpful on neonates. Um, because their their skin is so clear and the vein comes up so nicely. Um yeah. And ultrasound, I haven't seen ultrasound being used, but I don't see why it couldn't be used. But the flashlight is like much quicker um and probably doesn't require as much technical skill. Yeah, ultrasound's fantastic for you know the deep structures but as long as i can see something the the ultrasound only allows me to see something uh which means it's mainly for deep stuff but if i can see it through any other means which is you know just tapping the vein tourniquet or the flashlight type situation i don't need the ultrasound because the ultrasound now i've got an extra thing on that i've got to handle um then i've got to put gel on and that's annoying as well it just makes every, it makes it easy procedure difficult unless I can't see the structure I'm going for. Yep, cool, thanks guys. We should call that a wrap. And um, yep, so there's at anesthesiacollective.com, I've got all the other courses that we're putting up for med, med students. If you're into, if you're about to become an intern into next year and you're about to do an anesthetic rotation, the ABCs of anesthesia series is my kind of really focused on getting you guys really good for your first anesthetic rotation or in, in your anesthetic rotation. So yeah, feel free to sign up for that. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us and thanks so much, James. It was just so helpful. And I just learned, you know, I, I just learned stuff that I hadn't done in so long as well. So, you know, thanks for putting that together. That was really great. Oh, thanks for having me. See you all. Thanks very much, guys. See you, next See you later. Thank Bye. You.